morning, everyone. It is lovely to be with you this morning on this. Uh, I'm not sure about where you are, but ra rather rainy Monday morning here. And today we are going to be thinking about objects in the British Museum collection, which allow us to understand a little about the people and their lives in ancient South America. So I'm going to begin, as always, by pulling up my PowerPoint for today's presentation. Let's get that started. From the beginning, always a good place to start, I feel. And I will also pick up my pointer. So today we are going to be thinking about ancient South America at the British Museum. And come on, here we go. Wonderful. And we're going to be thinking about two areas of what nowadays we would call the continent of South America. And that is the area up here towards the north, Mesoamerica, which is an historical and cultural area, technically, which forms part of North America. It extends from central Mexico through Belize, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and northern Costa Rica. And within this region of the Americas, pre-Columbian societies flourished for thousands of years before the Spanish colonization of the Americas. And as is so often the way in current historical and archeological terminology, uh, the division between ancient and modern South America from a Western perspective is seen as the arrival of Columbus in the Americas. So when you hear the term pre-Columbian, uh, it's referring to the period before travel from Western Europe led to, in inverted commas, the discovery uh, of a set of people who'd been living there for thousands of years and already knew they were there, to be honest. Now below Mesoamerica is the continent of South America, which today contains countries such as Brazil, Peru, Argentina, Chile and Venezuela. And the first evidence for agriculture in South America dates back to around 6,500 BC, when potatoes, chilies and beans began to be cultivated in the Amazon basin. Permanent settlements then developed, one of the earliest dating to around 4,700 BC in Peru. Groups of people for, formed permanent settlements across the continent with different cultural groups emerging, flourishing and interacting over hundreds or sometimes thousands of years. Now today we're going to be looking at a selection of cultures from across Central and Southern America using objects from the permanent British Museum collections and also a set of objects from the Andes, specifically the Central Andes, which come from a forthcoming exhibition on ancient Peru. We're going to begin with some cultures which developed in Mesoamerica. Now Mesoamerica simply means Middle America in Greek. And from around 7,000 BC, people in Mesoamerica began to farm maize, beans, squash, tomatoes, avocado and vanilla, and domesticated dogs and turkeys. And societies based around sedentary agricultural villages began to emerge. We'll be looking at some of these societies, such as the Aztecs, which developed in the region and became large urban communities organised around large city states. And Mesoamerica is one of only three regions of the world where writing is known to have independently developed. The others being ancient Sumer in Mesopotamia, 
around the modern country of Iraq and in China. And we are going to be looking in particular at cultures which developed in the southern part of modern Mexico. We're going to be looking also at the Maya culture, which developed on the Yucatan Peninsula and the Aztec Empire, eventually, which developed along with the Maya Empire across many territories, encompassing many other peoples in the region. But we're going to start right near the beginning with a group of people known as the Olmec. And we know that the Olmec flourished in Mesoamerica from around 1500 to 400 BC. And they were the first Mesoamerican civilization, i.e. they were a group of people who had moved from small agricultural settlements towards large built environments, urban centers, with a hierarchy within society and specific jobs across the community. One of which is predicated on the fact that your city, which cannot provide enough food for itself, can control enough territory in the surrounding farmland to have food grown and imported to the city which then supports the work of specialists such as artists who do not have to farm because food is being farmed and imported to the city on their behalf. And this is, in essence is what we mean by a city state. People will often talk about the city of, what they actually mean is the city state. Uh, and it's a rather like imagining um, that the centre of London was the city of London, surrounded by the 33 boroughs. And the 33 boroughs are where the agricultural and the sustaining work goes on, which allows the city of London to function. So it's that idea that the city is not just the capital, the urban centre, but all the hinterland and the farmland around it. And all of the cultures that we're going to be talking about today are built around that idea of a number of city-states. Now the Omlak lived in the tropical lowlands on the Gulf of Mexico in present-day Mexico. And the name Olmec comes from the ancient Mesoamerican Nuttall language, and it is a word used by other people for the Olmecs. And the word is composed of two components. The first bit, ol, meaning natural rubber, and mektal, meaning people. So in effect, it means that these people were known as the rubber people. And rubber was a very important commodity in Mesoamerican societies. Now, because very little Olmec text has survived, we don't know the name that the Olmec people gave themselves, but the name Olmec, given to them by other people living in the region, is the name that continues to be used today. And what we have here on the left is a votive axe. Now, a votive object can look like a functional object, in this day an axe, in this case the axe with the handle and the blade beneath, but being votive means that it is not used for its everyday function, but instead operates as a sacred object and is very often an object which is gifted to the gods as a way to make the gods happy to ensure stability within your world. So a votive object is an object gifted to the gods. And this votive object is in the form of a figure with a large head and a smaller body, which narrows down to the blade at the end of what would have been a functional axe. The mouth is slightly open with a flaring upper lip 
and the corners are turned down. It has very distinctive flaming eyebrows and there's a cleft in the middle of the head. And on the lower part, we can see that incised into the surface are the hands and a loincloth. And next to it, we have an image taken slightly from the side, which shows more clearly the cleft going through the top of the axe and also shows you more clearly the shape of the body going down towards the thinner blade end of a working axe. Now this ceremonial axe combines characteristics of two animals who we see here on the right. The jaguar at the top and the caiman at the bottom. The most powerful predators living in the rivers and forests of the tropical lowlands. Caiman have scaly skin and live a fairly nocturnal life. Their closest relative is the alligator and they live in marshes and swamps. The jaguar, meanwhile, is the largest wild cat species in the Americas. And this pronounced clef on the head of our votifax is believed to mimic the indentation found on the skulls of jaguars. These clefts feature on other Olmac sculptures and also in imagery where plants spring from the cleft, alluding to the underground sources of fertility and life. The idea that when you plant your seed, your seed goes into the ground and from that seed, life then springs up as the plant grows. The plant then develops, you then have a harvest and the plant has given you food and new seeds, which then continue that cycle of life into the next agricultural year. A combination of symbols on the ax proclaims that it has a magical power. And the idea is probably a combination of the cleft at the top of the head and the fact that the object is in the form of an axe. So in effect, this object is believed to be able to cleave open, break open portals to the underworld. And it's reinforcing the association of agriculture with axes, axes being a key tool for felling forest trees and clearing ground for planting. So this object, in terms of its form, in terms of its iconography, in terms of its association with powerful aspects of the local environment, accumulates an inner force and these objects were probably handed down from one generation to the next as an important ritual heirloom and a way of believing and hoping and expecting that that circle of life, in particular agricultural life, would continue uninterrupted because it is that development of farming and the bounty that a farm landscape gives society that enabled those villages to grow then into towns and cities. This is another object from the Olmec people. It's a small mask dating to around 900 BC and it's made of a green stone and probably would have been worn around the neck as a pendant. Now, you'll know from some of our previous talks that one of the things that's always fascinating on a museum object is its museum number. And here we can see that this mask has a museum number AM, meaning it's part of the Americas collection, 1938, which we now know is the date when it entered the British Museum collection, and then two further numbers representing the 21st of October, 
the date in 1938 when it was registered into the collection, and then a final number showing that it was the 14th object registered into the American collections on that date. And if we look on the back of the model face, we can see the number 14, which correlates with it being the 14th object coming into the America's collection that day. And we also see that it has a little label handwritten with the name GAN. And this is because this object was purchased from a Dr. Thomas GAN, who probably acquired it in British Honduras, modern Belize, where he was working as a district medical officer between 1894 and 1923. And he later worked as a lecturer in archeology span at the University of Liverpool. And this object collected by him in modern Belize was then sold by him to the British Museum in 1938. And these little labels on the back have now become part of the history of the object. So not only does the object have its original Mesoamerican history, it's now starting to accumulate a museum history and a museum story. Now the drawing of the front of the mask shows us that incised on the cheeks, not quite so easy to see in this photograph, but clear in the drawing, are two incised glyphs on either side of the mouth. And the existence of an omelette writing system has been a matter of long standing debate because there's little evidence on omelette objects apart from individual glyphs for any sort of longer written text. We know that individual glyphs were written as part of Mesoamerican writing systems, a good example being glyphs which stand for a place name. They don't directly capture spoken sound, so they don't really constitute writing, but they can be recognised as referring to a particular place. I suppose the closest you come nowadays is, say, a logo on something that you buy, which indicates the brand. It's immediately recognisable, but doesn't actually correlate to spoken language where it's being used and, and indeed the logo can be used across many different spoken languages and people will still recognize it. The Omlek people lived in Mesoamerica and an important thing we need to remember about the cultures of Mesoamerica is that peoples didn't disappear but cultures and their way of life and the people in an area uh, would either develop and evolve into what archaeologists then call a, a different culture, give it a different name, or through interaction with nearby regions, they become subsumed into more dominant cultures. And we're now going to look at an example of a well-known dominant culture in Mesoamerica, the Aztec. The Aztecs were a culture that flourished in Central America from around AD 1300 to 1521. So the Mesoamerican cultures that we are looking at today equate not only to what we would call European prehistory, to a time when in British history we might be talking about um, places such as Stonehenge, but also continue through into what we in Europe would call modern history. So we're looking here at a people, the Aztecs, who are flourishing in what British history would term the medieval into the early Tudor period. Now the Aztec people included different ethnic groups from central Mexico and refer specifically to groups who spoke the Natal language. Aztec culture was organized into city-states, some of which joined together to form alliances and empires. And while the name Aztec is widely used today, the Aztecs called themselves the Mexica. 
And what we have here are two slit drums made from wood. The top one is decorated with a carving of a horned owl. And as a creature of the night hides in hidden recesses, the owl was seen as an emissary from the underworld. So an animal that linked the human upper world with the spiritual, the mythical underworld. These types of drums known as slit drums were made from hollow hardwood logs and they were often fire hardened. There were two slits on the top cut into the shape of an H and that's slightly easier to see here on the lower drum. And that resulted in two tongues of wood divided in the middle by the cross line of the H. And these two strips of wood could be struck with rubber headed wooden mallets or with deer antlers. And since the tongues were usually of different lengths and could be carved into different thicknesses, the instrument produced two different pitches. They were used in dances, poetry reading, celebrations, and in warfare as a means of communication. And this drawing we see to the right is from a 16th century codex, and it shows a ceremony with a slit drum, which we see here at the front, with each individual tongue being played with a separate drumstick, and the tongue supported uh, sorry, the drum supported on a wooden frame, and then behind it, a larger upright tubular drum, again made with a wooden body, standing on three small legs and with a skin stretched over the top, which is being played by hand. And the image that we see here is from a codex, which means a book, known as the Florentine Codex, which was actually created as an ethnographic research study of the Aztec culture by a Spanish friar living in Mexico from 1545 up until his death in 1590. And it's currently held in a library in Florence, hence its name. So it gives us a, a Western European perspective on late Aztec life and aspects of that culture that survived once the Spanish had arrived on the shores of Mesoamerica. And the lower slit drum we can see is formed in shape of a crouching human being and some of the drums have holes carved into the decoration to increase the volume made as the drum is struck. We're looking here at another Aztec object. This is the statue of an Aztec goddess and her name is Tlaxitl. Now the sound bull, bull represented by the written TL of the English letters T and L uh, is very prominent in a lot of Natal language. And when people see it, they're often immediately struck um, by the difficulty of pronouncing such a sound. There is no TL sound that we would naturally assume occurred in the English language. However, the easiest way to remember how to say it is to think about the word atlas, which does indeed have a TL in the middle of it, and it's that full sound that we see in a lot of Aztec words. It also occurs in the English word tomato, which has its roots in the Aztec word tomato, and it's just been anglicised down to tomato, so we've transferred the little sound at the end of tomato into an O. Aztec cultures 
the view of the world in which every aspect of life and nature had its own god or goddess, and over 200 of them are currently known about. The gods could appear in many different appearances, and different gods could split apart or join with other gods to make a hybrid, a twinned god. They could also take multiple names or share the same name with other gods. It's an incredibly complex religious belief system, which also is manifest not only in the temples of the cities, which is where this sculpture would have come from, but meant that gods were venerated on a local level with different communities venerating a particular god or goddess. It's rather similar to the idea of ancient Athens, where their most prominent goddess was the goddess Athena, out of the whole pantheon of Greek gods and goddesses. Now, this particular goddess was associated with spinning, weaving, childbirth, and healing. And her spectacular fan-shaped headdress would originally have been made from beaten bark cloth and brightly painted. She's made from a single rather thin slab of sandstone, which has imposed constraints on both its depth and volume. So there's a base at the bottom and then the carving of the figure itself, starting from the top of the legs going through to the face. And the actual sculpture itself has a width of 57 centimetres. But if we then look at the back and consider how deep it is from the front to the back, it has an overall depth for the figure of only 14 centimetres. And as you can see, it has in the past sustained damage. There's a crack running across the neck here. And it's those thin joining areas on the sculpture here between the body through to the bottom of the face that are the most most vulnerable to damage and very often when you come into the museum and you look at any sculpture or statue you will see that damage lines often run at the narrowest part of a sculpture or damage occurs at isolated points and you can see here there's damage to both the elbows which stick proud of the whole sculpture and therefore more vulnerable to being damaged either in life or when the object falls after it goes out of human circulation. The Maya are the next civilization we're going to be thinking about and the Maya were a Mesoamerican civilization that developed in the region that today comprises southern Mexico across into Guatemala and Belize. And they also occupied the western parts of modern Honduras and El Salvador. So we know that they were using the landscape and developing their city states in a region to the east of where the Aztecs were living. And the Maya people were noted for their highly developed writing system their architecture, their mathematics, their calendar, and their astronomical system. And Maya is a modern term used to refer to the various people that lived in this region. They didn't call themselves Maya, and we don't know to what extent they had a sense of common identity or political unity apart from where one particular city-state would conquer and then subsume surrounding regions. What we do have here is the sculpture of a common Mayan god, the Maze God. And he is shown wearing a stylized corn cob on his head. And his hair is formed from the silk of the corn cob those wispy threads that you see growing out of the side of a ripened corn cob. The head 
is disproportionately large compared to the narrow shoulders and torso. And it was probably carved out of two separate blocks of limestone, which were then joined together. And if you look very carefully, you can see a break mark where the two pieces have been put back together, which probably represents the region where the two original pieces of stone were joined. Now, maize gods were very prominent in Maya art, and this particular god personifies the agricultural cycle associated with abundance and prosperity. Maize was a native of Mesoamerica, initially cultivated and domesticated in Mexico and then spreading to the rest of the region. And originally maize grew with a number of different colored cobs. We're very used to seeing just yellow corn cobs, which are the variety um, grown and preferred by modern consumers but in ancient times, cobs came with many different coloured little kernels. Now, maize, when dried, could be made into flour ground on a stone slab. And one of the most common ways to use maize flour was to make maize bread, which could be filled, wrapped in a maize leaf and steamed. And we know that the Aztec, the Maya, as well as the Olmec, used these little cornbreads known as tamales as easily portable food for hunting trips, when traveling long distances and for feeding their armies. Now tamales were also considered to be the sacred food of the gods and the Aztec, Maya and Olmec all considered themselves to be people of the corn. In fact, the Maya believed that the gods had created the first people from individual corn cobs. One of the most significant rituals for the Aztecs was a feast known as the eating of the water tamils. It was a ritual held every eight years for a whole week which involved eating plain tamils with no seasoning, spice or filling. We can see here uh, a little steamer of modern tamils. Very often nowadays they are wrapped in banana leaf before they are steamed. And above we have a Maya beaker dating from around AD 600. And it shows a scene of tribute being delivered to a seated ruler who is being brought tributes, being brought gifts from people living in the regions that his city state controls. And you can see that one of the objects being presented to him is a basket of Tamils. And above this basket, we have some glyphs which indicate his names and titles. And he himself is wearing jewellery, elaborate clothing and a wrapped headcloth adorned with flowers. And the fact that the tamales are being presented to him as part of this tribute ritual, again, reinforces the idea of maize being a central commodity in sustaining life in Mesoamerica. And therefore it assumes a sacred role because without the maize to sustain it, human life and the development of the city states would not have been possible. The Maya city state of Yaxchilan is shown here on this modern archeological map. Now we know that the city itself dates from around 359 AD. And 400 years later, it expanded to become a regional capital with a monumental building program that included the erection of large, richly decorated buildings which transformed the centre of the city. And it is thought that around this time, there were about 20,000 people living 
in Yaxchilan. There may have been in other Mayan cities populations of up to 100,000 people. Now Yaxchilan itself contained temples and other buildings around large open squares known as plazas and the archaeologists who've investigated the city have given the buildings numbers so very often when you are looking at objects or sites from Mesoamerica you will see that they are known as temple 33 as we see marked here or structure 23. It's very similar to the way that archaeologists number ancient Egyptian tombs around Luxor uh, which was the ancient city of Thebes. Therefore, the tombs are known as TT, Theban tomb, 99, or TT, 17. So whenever you see numbering in a museum context, it's usually a way of organizing the buildings and structures where we may very often not know the name of the original building or in some cases not even know its original function. This shows us what Yaxchilan looks like nowadays. The site of the city is an archaeological ruin and the best preserved parts of the ancient buildings are the foundations which are still buried underground and the bottom parts of the walls which have survived. And we can see here from this archaeological map and by using the brown contour lines that the city sited next to a river was built rising away from the river up onto the top of the nearby hills and it's the summit of these local hills which are being used here with the South Acropolis and the West Acropolis as the large temple sites. So the temples would have stood on high ground near the skies and would have been visible from all the lower parts of the city. And that's a very common way of organizing your built environment. It's something we see in British history where funerary barrows are often built up on the tops of hillsides to be visible from the surrounding land. And also probably most famously, the Parthenon in Athens, which is built on top of the Acropolis in the center of the city. And again, rises above the people of the city living below and takes it as a site away from common use and everyday use into a sacred sky site. Now buildings, Maya buildings, had lintels or horizontal slabs of stone above the doorways leading into the buildings and these lintels supported the weight of the walls and the roof above and the lintels were often decorated with important scenes from Maya life. These scenes showed off the power of the rulers. Now, interestingly, if you come to the British Museum to look at these Maya lintels, you'll see that they are displayed on the wall. But originally, if you had been in a Mayan city, their original position would have been above your head. And you would have seen them as you walked through the doorway from the outside to the inside of the temple. And these pictures you'd have had to have cricked your neck back to look above you to see them. And this particular lintel shows a ritual being performed by the king of Yaxchilan and his wife. Now we know that this particular king came to the throne in October 1681 and ruled Yaxchilan until his death in AD 742. The king holds a flaming torch of his wife who kneels to the right. The lintel was originally painted and it still has traces of both red and blue pigment. And we have information about exactly who is shown in the glyphs carved into the lintel. And the name of the king and his wife and the city they live in 
are all in these glyphs. So we see here the first two glyphs in the text at the top, they give us a date for when this took place. And the last glyph in that line, which you see here represented at the side, sorry here, the last glyph in the line, which you see represented at the side, that's the name of the city, Yaxchilan. And above it, we have the name of the king, who is known to archaeologists from the two creatures uh, in from the creatures in his glyph as Lord Shield Jaguar. Uh, that is not the name he would have been known by by his family. Uh, and then we have his wife, whose Maya name is known. She is Lady Kabul. Cox and her glyph is shown here on the left. Now the ritual shown probably took place at night, hence the flaming torch. And in it, Lady Cox pulls a thorned rope through her tongue in the performance of a blood sacrifice performed by royal women. And scrolls of blood can be seen around her mouth and then the rope itself falls down onto an open codex an open Maya book Lord Shield Jaguar is shown wearing a headdress colourful feathers from local birds such as the Quetzal bird shown here which was hunted for its long green tail feathers, which were then worn by rulers in their headdresses. He has a loincloth wrapped around the middle of his body and between his legs, similar to that loincloth we saw incised onto the votive omelette axe. And this cloth would have been about three meters long. The most common fabrics used by the Maya were cotton, bark cloth, or hemp fabric. And on his, shirt, on his feet, he wears sandals with a hard sole. And you can see the rather natty thongs which go between the toes and then tie around the ankle to hold the sandal in place. Lady Cox has a headdress, the basis of which would have been wood or stiffened cloth. She wears earrings, probably made from a precious metal, such as gold, or from a precious stone, such as green jade. And she wears a pendant of the sun god, again, probably made from gold. And her very elaborately woven tunic falls full length. And because she's kneeling, you can see that the artist has very cleverly shown it rolled and scrolled behind her, where it falls over her lower legs as she kneels down. The Maya civilization lasted for hundreds of years. It went through a number of historical periods. So often when you're reading about the Maya, you will hear about periods called the classical and the post-classical period, which are all modern divisions of the Maya history by modern archeologists. And the Maya continued as a civilization through into the early Spanish colonization of Mesoamerica with their last city falling to Spanish domination in 1527. We're now going to go into our 10 minute break, after which we are going to move from some of the civilizations and peoples of Mesoamerica to look at some of the peoples living in Southern America, particularly in the modern country of Peru. Thank you. Hello, welcome back to South America. And what we're going to do in the second half of our talk today is to move from Mesoamerica down onto the main continent of South America. And we're going to be looking in particular at an area on the west coast of South America, uh, the Andes. Now, the Andes as a mountain range extend nowadays north to south through seven 
South American countries, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. We're going to be looking specifically at objects from the Central Andes, a region which falls within modern Peru. More than 15,000 years ago, people migrated to South America from the north and populated the Central Andes. Over time, people successfully adapted to the deserts along the Pacific coast, to the river valleys, the high mountains, and the tropical forests of the region. An area with a very diverse and set of distinct landscapes and ecosystems. Now, as you'll know from the first half of the talk, when one is studying a region historically, one is usually working with a division of time and a way of grouping people that has been imposed uh, through modern study. So with Mesoamerica, we were able to talk about the Olmec or the Aztec or the Maya. And as we discovered in the first half of our talk, these may not be the names that people know themselves by. They may not be groupings that people at the time would instinctively recognize. And in modern parlance, the best way to think about it is that if you were studying the history of London nowadays and you were talking about the borough of Camden, at one point within Camden, and you can see it on the roadsides around the British Museum, there was an area which was the borough of Holborn and St Pancras, and it's still there on some of the road signs, but it no longer exists. The area is still there and the people who lived in that borough are still there. And therefore, what I'm going to do during the second half of our talk is to focus not so much on particular civilizations or cultures, but to look at the ways of life and the things that were important to people living in the Andes over a period of several thousand years. And we'll then finish with what is probably the most famous civilization from the Andes, the Inca. But for the first part, what we're doing is we're saying, not let's worry about how these people have been divided up by modern historians or archeologists. Let's go to the objects and let's look at these objects and see what they tell us it was like to live as an individual at a particular time in a particular region, regardless of what we call that region and those people nowadays. And I often think that's quite a good way to start understanding a part of history or a historical region that you're not familiar with. Uh, when I first went into the Mexican gallery at the British Museum, um, I thought, oh, I know about the Aztecs. And then I started seeing other names like the Olmec and the Tomac, and I was, I was confused. And it, it just, it didn't make sense. But if you start with the objects, and you start to look at the objects and the people behind them, then slowly that understanding of how the different periods and the different groups of people interact begins to emerge. So never be put off by the titles and the labels on the walls and the way that the curators have decided to divide up history and people. Go to the objects, always a good starting point. So for the people living in the Andes region of modern Peru, they were living in societies with no writing and therefore objects held symbolic meaning and communicated ideas and beliefs. And the symbols on this piece of fabric represent different landscapes in the Andes. They've been painted on with cream and brown natural pigments after the textile has been woven. And they're arranged in a series of bands. The top one shows feathers representing the Amazon rainforest. We then have a set of circles 
possibly representing mountain pools up in the Andes. And then there's a running design at the bottom depicting the moving waves of the Pacific Ocean. A textile weaving for the central Andean people was a community-based activity demanding many years of training. Textiles were needed for everyday clothing, but the most important materials and the greatest skills were used to create cloth for rituals and funerary purposes, and we'll see some of those later. Now this bowl shows a textile workshop where eight women are weaving textiles using waste looms. And there's a little close up here of a pair of these women, and you can see how the loom is sitting here, tucked into their waist as they kneel on the ground. And alongside them are ceramic vessels and spindle whirls, which were the weights used to spin the yarn. The scene also shows textile samplers, which the women would have used as a guide for different motifs and techniques whilst they were weaving the pieces of cloth. And cloth is very well preserved in modern Peru, particularly pieces of cloth used in funerary contexts where they have sat for many thousands of years in high remote mountain caves which are very cool and most importantly, very dry. Therefore, there's a greater amount of textile surviving from ancient South America than there is say from ancient Western Europe where the climate is a lot colder and a lot wetter. Now, maize we've already heard was central to the lifestyle of peoples living in Mesoamerica. And the same is true for South America. Maize was first grown in the Andes around 6,000 years ago and has been part of people's basic diet ever since. It can be ground into flour, eaten as a vegetable, or used to make a ritual alcoholic drink. Communities communicated with gods in the hope of maintaining order and balance in what to them seemed a very changeable world. And we've already talked about the importance of the agricultural year and the importance of having a regular weather system that enabled that agricultural year to cycle through from planting your seed to growth of the plants to a successful harvest. And here we see some wonderful representations of deities associated with maize. And these are a way of commemorating, of making real in pottery, the idea of how important maize is and the idea that there is a deity, there is a supernatural being who is responsible for ensuring the cycle of maize growth whom you have to acknowledge and please. The deity to the left has big cat fangs, is holding a maize stalk and wears a headdress decorated with maize cobs. The deity next to it uh, has a body actually formed from maize cobs and two smaller accompanying figures I think this is really rather a lovely object. You can see where the individual maize cobs have been clumped together to form the bodies of the three beings. And again, they are shown with the fangs of a big cat. Because as in Mesoamerica, the big cats, the jaguars living in the tropical rainforests are seen as one of the most powerful animals in the local environment. And here at the top, we have a shallow jar, a little spout, pouring spout at the top. And you'll see that the upper surface of this jar is covered with little maize cobs. So what you see around you in both everyday and ritual life, indicating how important maize is to sustaining that way of life. 
Now, for the Andean people, nature itself was a living being. It symbiotically sustained all life. And different parts of nature, different aspects of the natural world were believed to manifest as divine beings, gods and goddesses, who had supernatural powers to control the natural world and to address the needs of society. And three of the most powerful animals in Andean religion was the snake, the bird, and the feline, so big cats, big cats. And they were central to how the people of the Andes understood the world around them. Birds represented the sky and were a symbol of nighttime and war. We have a lovely bird pottery jug here. Big cats, felines, represented power. And deities and warrior priests were often shown with the features of owls or birds of prey, along with feline fangs, as we saw on the maze gods, and a tail. Meanwhile, snakes were believed to have the ability to travel through the underworld, where the ancestors rested, giving access to both worlds and connecting the realms of the past, where the ancestors from the past lived, and the present, the land where the living community lived. So these vessels are not only containers, but they're a way of expressing meaning through the shapes into which they are formed. They're made from pottery, Clay was readily available, easy to mould, and the final objects were portable. And what I think is particularly interesting is that not only do we have discrete animals, we can clearly see here we have a little bird. We can see here we have a jaguar with a spotted skin. Uh, we can see here what is probably meant to be um, a fierce smaller wild cat. It, it looks a bit like a, a mouse to me, but it, it is a feline. There's its long tail. But down below, this one, interestingly, has a combination of these animals. So the front part of the body, wild cat, and then if you look at its tail, its tail is long and curly and ends with what is probably a snake face. So you can have the animals with their individual powers of moving through the sky, of moving through the underworld, of embodying natural power as a key predator, but you can also then combine those animals to make an even more powerful mythical creature, which draws on the combined powers here of the predator, big cat, and the snake. This is a piece of textile. It's a woven textile with an embroidery of hummingbirds. And it dates to around 100 BC through to possibly AD 200. And the hummingbirds on this textile hold objects, perhaps flowers or nectar. And their red and yellow colouring stands out against an indigo background and here you can see we've got a close-up detail of, of a pair of the hummingbirds from the main textile. Now Peru is home to more than a hundred species of hummingbirds which play a vital role in pollination and increasing plant fertility across the region. So nice link back here to this idea of being sustained by nature, of nature driving and supporting that agricultural, that natural year of seeding, blooming, fruiting. And the Aztecs celebrated hummingbirds on textiles, in ceramics and in geoglyphs. And we can see here to the right one of the geoglyphs 
incised into the desert landscape and by comparing it with the textiles we can quite clearly see how they have incised the shape of the hummingbird with its wings, its tail, one of its claws and then that beak, the long beak that reaches forward into the flower to collect the nectar and at the same time helps to pollinate the flower. Now this textile is probably part of a cloak used in a funerary event. The base is cotton, while the hummingbirds are embroidered, embroidered with fibres from the llama family. Uh, llamas, one of the native animals to the Andes, domesticated, and its fibre, its wool, then used for weaving and sewing. And the dyes used to create the red, the green and the yellow, all drawn from plants with an indigo background. And these textiles would have been part of the wrapping, the many layers of a funerary bundle that were wrapped around someone's body when they were buried. The people were also using the landscape as a canvas. And this hummingbird is one of a number of massive drawings known as geoglyphs, which are created by removing the top layer of earth and exposing the lighter soil beneath. And pieces of pottery and offerings found near the geoglyphs suggest that people walked along the lines and performed rituals to celebrate their relationship with the landscape. We know from images painted on ceramic objects showing these ceremonies that panpipes, drums and whistles would have been played to augment the sound around the ceremony. Now, these geoglyphs are drawn on what are known as the Nascar Plains. They're often known as the NASCAR lines. NASCAR is the name given to one of the groups of people living in Peru. And aerial views taken by drones show how the lines, geometric shapes and intricate images are laid out on the ground. Some of them up to two kilometers long. And in the years leading up to 2020, about a hundred new sets of lines have been discovered with the use of drones and archaeologists believe there are more to be found. Now hundreds of them are simple lines and geometric shapes. About 70 of the existing known lines are zoomorphic, which means they show animals such as the hummingbird we've just seen, the spider, the fish, heron, there's a monkey, a lizard, cat, dog and human, and other shapes include trees and flowers. And what we have here are three examples. If you go online and put in NASCAR lines, you'll be able to pull up beautiful images of all the different lines have been found. But these are three of my favourite. Here we see a tree and you can see where the lines have been laid out across the relief of the underlying desert landscape. We have the branches of the tree and beautifully represented at the bottom, the roots of that tree going down into the ground and sustaining the tree above. <laughs> Below, uh, we have a flower. I mean, isn't that just gorgeous? Straight stem and then the petals on the flower head. And then here to the right, we have a dog. And I have to say that one of the things I enjoy most about this dog is its little paws. <clears throat> I've got a little beagle and when she gets very excited, she spreads her little paws out on the ground and each of her little claws seems to splay out. And she looks just like this little dog from a thousand years ago. So do have a little look online at some of the other NASCAR lines. They are quite, quite exquisite. 
we're going to finish today by looking at the Inca civilization. And the Inca civilization arose in the Peruvian highlands sometime in the early 1200s. And this civilization developed into an empire, eventually covering a vast territory that included parts of modern day Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, Colombia, as well as the whole of Peru. And this Inca rule extended to cover nearly a hundred linguistic or ethnic communities, which covered around nine to 14 million people. So a huge empire in ancient South America. The Inca created huge built landscapes in which distinctive stone architecture merged with the natural setting. And Machu Picchu is a typical and very well known example of this. The Inca used official art as one of the ways to consolidate their identity and their control as their empire extended into the territories of other people and thousands of skilled craft workers were sent to provisional centers to produce objects used in rituals and ceremonies. The Inca had no written language, but used a system of knotted strings to record information. And this Inca site is high up in the mountains. It is a site called Moray. And here the Incas have cut terraces into the steep slopes of the Andes to create concentric terraces, the whole system of which has a temperature variation between the top and the bottom of about 10 degrees. In addition, they built aqueducts to bring water from surrounding springs and cut vertical channels to drain water from one level to another. And this allowed them to grow crops at different altitudes to provide food for their empire. And more than two million acres of terraced agricultural land had been engineered from the Andes by around 1520. In common with the peoples of Mesoamerica and South America, Maize was key to the Inca Empire. And here we see a ritual vessel, a drinking vessel, which is shaped in the shape of a foot plow, which an Inca farmer would have used to prepare the soil for planting the seeds. Above the foot plow, you can see that there is an ear of maize. There's a little detail of it here to the left. And on top of the foot plough, we have a jar which would have held an alcoholic drink made from fermented maize, which was used as part of the ritual. And the jar, the detail of which we can see to the right, has painted patterning on it in what is known as the Inca fern pattern. And the three elements, the jar, the model of the foot plough, and the model of the maize cob, combine to make a ritual object known as a paca, used for pouring water during fertility ceremonies to ensure a good harvest. Each year at the beginning of the agricultural cycle, there was a ritual known as the opening of the earth, whereby the Inca king, accompanied by lords of the principal provinces of the empire, would gather to break the ground with large foot plows. And they would be accompanied by chanting, singing and drinking to mark the festival of first planting. The corn cob on this pucker, together with the jar at the top, therefore encapsulate the whole agricultural cycle of maize from planting to harvest. 
The pucker itself is hollow. There's an opening at the top of the jar to allow the fermented maize beer to be poured in. It then circulates through the vessel before escaping through a narrow hole at the tip of the foot plow to symbolically irrigate and inseminate the earth. Our next object is also a ritual object. It's a cylindrical bowl made from volcanic rock. It's sculpted from a single block of black basalt. And around it are 10 serpents heads symmetrically arranged around its rim. And it's one of a small number of vessels of this size that survive from the Temple of the Sun in the Inca Empire capital city. It was probably used as a receptacle, receptacle for liquid offerings or perhaps to hold water which would have created a still reflected surface regarded as an eye for seeing into the underworld. And the tight coils of the snake's body are believed to mimic the whirls and eddies of a dynamic river or stream running through the mountains. Water being a key component in the successful irrigation of agricultural land to support the empire. Now, as well as objects from ancient South America, the British Museum continues to collect objects from South America. And I'd like to finish with this object, which is a modern manta collected in Peru. And it references the square woven garments traditionally worn around the so shoulders in Peru. This one is a maroon velvet background embroidered with Inca figures. And on the back, it is covered with gray coffin, cotton. It was collected in Peru in 1975 and purchased by the British Museum in 1982. And it is part of a dance festival held in Peru. And they are worn by the women taking part in the dance, part of the dance costume, whereby the women represent Spanish ladies and they wear a dancing skirt, a Victorian cut blouse, which we can't see, and then draped around their shoulders, they have this manta or mantle. And it is embroidered. And very often there will be an accompanying embroidered rectangle worn over the front of the skirt. Examples of this type of garment have been collected dating from 1915 right up to the 1970s. They're commissioned by the women who want to wear them for the dance festivals and the themes on them such as this one we see here are sometimes taken from published sources such as calendars or historical scenes from children's textbooks and I think if you look at this one it does indeed almost look like a line drawing of ancient Inca life in a children's textbook which the embroiderer has used as inspiration. And again, the idea is that within Peruvian life, the landscape, the sacred mountains, the breaking of the ground for the growing of maize, the relationship of sun and rain and natural animals all come together to form the main aspects and the key elements that sustained all the different civilizations in this area of the world from ancient times to some degree all the way through to today. So thank you very much indeed for joining me and we now have some time for any questions people might have. 
Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. A very interesting whistle stop tour. Uh, it, I was due to tour around Peru last April, obviously cancelled. Not sure when it, if it will be rescheduled. I've previously visited Mexico and East and West Coast. They have a very different ancient civilization and geography. All right. So, uh, first question is um, Did all of these, these cultures build pyramids? And what uses did they put their pyramids, pyramids to? Ah, uh, I think you may be referencing um, the Maya monumental buildings, which are often referred to as pyramids. They're sometimes also called ziggurats, which is the name for the stepped pyramids in ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, they... Two interesting things. One, they appear to have the same function as the ancient Egyptian pyramids in that they are ritual buildings. All of these civilizations, once they got to city level, would have had ritual buildings as part of the urban environment. And the idea was that these buildings, if they were ritual buildings, would rise above the, the natural human world, the lower buildings. So they were deliberately built very tall. So the idea of the pyramid rising up is seen in all ancient South American cities. The idea was that the top of the pyramid, and this is where it's a bit different from Egyptian pyramids, which were built to house a tomb. There's a tomb underneath Egyptian pyramids. And um, the top of these South American pyramids if we call them that um, have a ritual space a little temple and they often have a long flight of stairs down one side which enabled the priest or priestess to walk up to the temple area at the top which was believed to be the home of a particular god or goddess so they were a combination of a building that marked very often a grave of a former ruler but also a building that served as a sacred space with the idea that the gods were above humans and to reach them you had you had to go up to the top of the building so in answer to your question all city civilizations had monumental buildings such as this the idea of that building being tall of reaching up into the sky is common to all of them uh, they're not all necessarily the traditional pyramid form and the word pyramid itself is applied by modern experts so it takes us back to this idea of we often apply words that make sense to us but wouldn't have made sense to the people in the past but if we said say did everyone build huge ritual structures yes thank you that's very good um, with the nazca lines do we know actually how they were how they were made because and to get those proportions because obviously they didn't have the drones that we have so how do they actually create the nazca lines they are still a huge number of unanswered questions about the nazca lines um we know on a very simple level how they created the indentation in the ground and it's very similar to the 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 chalk drawings that you have down on, on the Wiltshire Downs in that you remove the top layer of soil and you expose the under layer of soil in a contrasting colour. And you can then maintain that by either walking along, which like a footpath across grass maintains the lower level, or by artificially maintaining the lines by keeping them clean and clearing off any debris. In terms of how they were laid out, and how they were so accurately laid out. I mean, the lines on some of them um, are, ex are extraordinary when you think they are doing this with ancient technologies. There's still a lot of unanswered questions. So, you know, to be honest, I'm not even going to pretend I know. <laughs> uh, I don't think anyone knows for certain yet. I mean, obviously, there are ways that we know people in the ancient world laid out lines. We know that there's a lot of mathematical knowledge in the ancient world. Um, for example, if we go to ancient Egypt, the Rhind Papyrus is a mathematical text all about how you lay out the angles of a pyramid to ensure that as you build your pyramid, it reaches a point 
central to the bottom line of the pyramid. So we know there's a lot of uh, mathematical knowledge. We know that they are aware of the relationship between what is on the ground and the moving skies above, astronomy. Um, how they then drew all this knowledge together and what it then looked like when you were laying out a line is, is, is the missing bit of the puzzle. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, just, I'm just seeing if there's any more questions or nothing else so far. Well, I think we'll call that a, we'll call, we'll call that a day. That was fantastic. Thank you very much, Catherine. I hope to see you all next week. Lovely. You're most welcome. Have a lovely week, everyone, and, do, and don't get too wet. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Bye.